All right, it's season 20, episode 6 of I Should Be Writing. Hi there! Welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I am your host, Mer Lafferty. Been doing it since 2005 when I was a wannabe fiction writer, and then started traditionally publishing in the teens when all my listeners said I had to stop calling myself that, so I had to change the tagline of the show. But I've gotten lots of books out, I've been podcasting for a long time, so if you have any curiosities about my credentials, you can find them easily online. And whenever somebody gives you writing advice, check out their credentials, because they might just be saying stuff. But I am delighted to welcome onto the show today Gwenda Bond, author of The Frame Up, which is out now. Gwenda's been a good friend of mine for some time. I was with her when she was doing, when she was uh, drafting The Frame Up on a writer's retreat, and I'm just so excited to have you. How are you, Gwenda? I'm great. It's always good to hang out with you. Yeah, you basically rescued this book. I don't know if it would have gotten finished in a timely manner had we not got on that retreat. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, it was an interesting retreat. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit later. But first, um, I want to give my boss cone report. And Gwenda, we usually talk about what we've been up to. If you want to talk about what you've been up to, you can. And if you don't want to, then that's fine. But um, I went to boss cone and I'd had a thought in my head for a while. And um, I read from Chaos Terminal, but I just really was itching to get this thought down. It was like a chapter one of a new book. And I wrote it that afternoon. And then I read it at my reading that night. And everybody I told that to were shocked. Yeah, like, no, but that's, that's, but that's, yeah, because that's a lunatic thing to do. You just, like, <laughs> so, wrote it and then read it. <laughs> so glad I thought it was stupid too. Oh boy, I man. I think it was stupid. I thought very ballsy. Very, very, Every, yeah, uh, that's, that's brain. the word people have used is, is ballsy. I mean, I, I, I liked it. I thought it was a fun beginning. So I read it and yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I just like closed my eyes and crossed a freeway while all of my writer friends are going, don't do it. And I went, got to the other <laughs> side. Okay. And I'm like, what, what's the problem here? Because you, Elizabeth Bear, Joshua Bilmes, I mean, everyone's like, why would you do that? And the problem is, I mean, I that's get, very impressive. It's very you. impressive if you can write a, a draft and, you know, then just be able to read it. I mean, I know people who can do that. Clearly, you are one of them. Now. Oh wow! New club, <laughs> yay! New club. <laughs> anyway, so I started a new book. That was fun, and I read from Chaos Terminal, and people liked that too. And uh, overall, I mean, the con was also, good. I, I, would, I would have to give you props for writing while at a convention because I never managed to do that. Yeah, I did it like first day before anything really required my okay. attention so um yeah i didn't do it anymore after that <clears throat> well it was, it was i was at a con seeing my kid and my husband was there so you know there was yeah there were people to see even if i didn't like anybody at the con <laughs> which i did liked lots of people <laughs> anyway gwenda what have you been up to writing wise Oh, what have I been up to writing wise? Well, I just, uh, I've got two books that are late because um, I had a year <laughs> of doom and uh, then broke my ankle <laughs> right when I started to get back on track. Mm -hmm. uh, although I seem to be making a miraculous recovery because of recovery. I had surgery basically a month ago and I've been out of my boot for at least a week and wow. just walking in regular shoes and it seems fun. I mean, you could feel the screw under the skin if, that's, uh. if you're into that, but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't look that bad. Cringe. <laughs> um, no, so I'm, yeah, I'm working on um, both the follow-up to the frame-up, which is another standalone, and um, 
a historical fantasy series that will be my first under the pen name Gemma Bowen. Gemma Both Bowen. Of which will be okay. I thought that I've written too many kinds of things. And so historical Regency fantasy needed its own name. So as to stop confusing people with the fact that I just sort of dilettante write whatever I feel well, like. Well, I want to talk about that. Um, there's like so many when you're you start your career, you're thinking, I want to write this or I want to write that. And I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I had the thought that event career, I would be able to write in different genres if I got the idea. And you've done that. You've done uh, TV tie-in with Stranger Things. You've done mm -hmm. uh, Lois Lane tie-ins. Yeah. And you've done, uh, I can't just, you've done rom-com and this is your mystery. So, uh, lots of YA. Yeah, lots of YA. Are you are you seeing this as a? Do you see this as a down? Like, is this overall bad career wise, or is you just pulling a pen name out of your back pocket like part of the thing you do? And did you have that in your back pocket? And if not, where did you keep it? No, it okay. was uh, it was actually suggested the publisher asked if I would be willing to do something that was more Regency sounding. I think pen names are just more common now and they want also publishers love a debut. And so mm. since this is a big departure and I do have another publisher. So like these books may be coming out in the same years. Like I think there is something smart about separating off and you can always unseparate it, but it's a little bit. This one made sense to me because all my other books, I think, have the same feel. And this certainly, I think people who like my regular books will like it. And it'll be an open pseudonym. So it's like no one who is already a fan, hopefully, is like going to be surprised. But like for the Regency audience um, that these fantasy books are really uh, directed at, I think maybe there would be less crossover with my other books. And so it makes sense to me. And also it's fun to come up with a name. I wanted it to be Gwendolyn Banks because my grandmother's name was Gwendolyn and it would be Gwendolyn puts money in the banks, you see. Mm. But they were like, no, here's a, they actually gave me a couple lists of names. And then, but actually I think the one that my agent and I came up with was not on the list of, of names to mix and match mm -hmm. and create. Um, but it was fun. I mean, and that was kind of like, that's kind of my thing is like, I, it was fun. And when they proposed it, I thought, well, that'll be fun. Like to write something under a different name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really for people like at bookstores or searching things online, because if you can tell your fans what books you have coming out and they'll understand, right. whereas as our friend Ursula, her name is on her children's books. So when she writes her more bloody or otherwise upsetting right. or terrifying adult books you don't have a parent who's going to pick up a book with a rabbit on the front being eaten by mushrooms and think my kid will love this so yeah um, although yeah. i forgot what ursula's new book is called it's bugging me but it has a similarly uh, what terrifying the cover. That, what moves the dead, or is that the first one what moves the dead is the first uh the first one and the the one that came after I, I can picture the cover anyway um but yeah for what ursula it's very at important night. what feasts at night what feasts at night what feasts at night wow ursula's got good titles he does yeah um so let's let's talk about the frame up that is okay. the book we're, we're we're launching today and i did not get a chance to sure. grab my copy so you're gonna have to hold one up all right everywhere <laughs> <laughs> they're everywhere um the i wanted to write a heist book um because um um because it just seemed like a challenge and i love heist stories mm -hmm. and um i had an idea about a painting that's not simply a painting or that has an interesting history and um so i just kind of immersed myself in heist movies and books and till I was convinced there's no way I could do it and then uh, started to write it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do think heists are hard. Um, and uh, it's interesting because uh, I do think like, so the, the I don't want to, so it's hard to talk about this book without like 
saying too much and giving away spoilers, but sure. basically the main character, Danny, when she was 17, flipped on her mother, who was um, probably the world's best art thief and part of a, a crew of thieves who have magic. And her mom has been in prison ever since. And Danny has kind of been on the road by herself. And so her mother's mysterious former partner shows up where she's shaking down um, a douchebag for money, which is kind of how she fills her bank account. She finds scumbags and then sort of uh, fleeces them and gives part of their money to like whatever women that they've screwed over. Okay. Um, and she has a great border collie with her. And this gentleman archer tells her that if she steals this painting from this legendary collection called the fortress of art colloquially that no one's ever been allowed in run by kind of a, a billionaire type who died five years ago and his will has prevented anyone from being in it or selling it off until now um it's about to go up for auction and if she can get the painting from it then he will reunite her with her mother um which is something that she wants and so she has to go back home and kind of work her way back into the old crew because she has very little time to pull off this job. And so uh, there's also like the FBI art crime team, um, you know, so I really wanted it to be set in a version of our world with magic where these thieves have different magical gifts, but they also have to deal with the realistic world of what, when you're doing a crime, mm -hmm. you know, like I didn't want it to just make it too easy so I basically tried to write a book that would work on both levels. The mystery that plays fair on both the magic side and the reality side. Mm -hmm. So it's easy, easy peasy. Yeah, sounds it. <laughs> I yeah. mean, actually, when people say this book is fun, I'm like, that means that I pulled it off. Because mm -hmm. my favorite heist things are fun and uh and breezy and it certainly was not easy to write so whenever someone says you you know a book is fun and it was difficult to write you're like okay like you're not the, the seams are not showing yeah too much that's great I, I love heist things as well and always fear i'm not clever enough to write one so um if i can do it you can do it <laughs> but one thing you wanted to talk about was um I was with you when you were drafting this book because um, in 2022, we went to the beach together for a writer's yes. retreat, for an unplanned writer's retreat that basically came to pass when my family was trying to get a, get a beach house for vacation and did two weeks of um, reservations thinking we would cancel one of them before when they, everyone decided, but it got too late. And finally, I'm just like, I'll take the first week as a writing retreat for my friends. And I actually didn't think anybody would come because it was like <laughs> last like, minute yes. or whatever. But uh, no, we had, we had Gwenda, yeah. we had uh, Ursula and Kevin came down and Andrea Phillips. Yeah. Um, is that it? Cameron was going to come, but she didn't. Right. No, it was great. Yeah. It was great. So what what did you get out of the writer's retreat? Do you do that kind of thing often or grab it when I the option comes it. up all of a sudden? I think I did do it. And I think I'm going to do it more. Um, I do think there's a lot of research, actually. Like I read a book this year called The Nature Fix with one of my book clubs here in town. And there's all this research about how being in a different environment than your normal actually... Um, can increase creativity. Hmm. Um, and so I really do think there is, and there's also the thing of being unchained from your everyday responsibilities, right? Yes. Like, especially if you can just like make feeding yourself easy at a retreat, make, you know, like, you know, we did some walks, but we basically just were writing and then watching the after party at night mm -hmm. uh, and talking about writing stuff. And there was, I remember there were hardly any restaurants open because COVID had still sort of decimated and we could only do like takeout from two, like two places. Right. So we did a lot of grocery runs. And I think that all of those things kind of combine that you can just, I mean, I just remember like I had been having a terrible time finding time and space to work. 
And I remember sitting down that first morning writing 4,000 words and just feeling like I was high because <laughs> it had been so long since that had happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do think like also just being like, well, I've come here to write and I'm going to do it. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think we were both on pretty tight deadlines, mm-hmm. uh, too. So that also helps. But I think there's also something about being in with other people that are working in that way, like just an energy kind of thing that that you can sort of feed off each other. Yeah. I was feeding off you, Mar. <laughs> <laughs> feeding off your energy. <laughs> just an energy vampire, just sucking it up. <laughs> God, that's right. So yeah, so I remember, and I remember like some of my favorite parts of the book, like just that weren't planned, like characters that really I, I grew to like just sort of showed up on the page when I was there. So I have a very vivid sense memory of writing on that couch with the beach outside. That was a nice house. It was. Um, So what, besides putting together the, putting together the heist, what challenges did you face with this book? If any? Well, uh, I had to do quite a bit of research into late 1800s uh, painting academies in France, because there's a, an ancestor of the main character who uh, went to one of the, well, the first, um, traditional French painting school that allowed female students and let them do paintings from life and study in the same way that male painters got to study. And that was fascinating stuff. Um, But just to try to try and immerse myself in sort of that milieu and figure out how to bring that part into the story in a natural way and in a fun way. I actually hate it when I get to an italicized section in a book. Um, you know, like I often am like, oh God, here we go. Like italicized letters or, you know, whatever, boring. Uh, so I really felt like if I was going to put in an italicized section, it had to, it had to hold my interest <laughs> and everyone else's. Yeah. So hopefully it does that. But yeah, there's like a, a little book within a book, um, which I always do love actually, but it just, um, and it's not italicized. I think we said it in a different type, but it was italicized when I wrote it. And I was just like, my editor's like, I love this, expand it. Um, and I was like, okay, good. So I, I'm not committed the, the uh, just skip these pages of, of italics um, sin that I hate when I encounter it in books. And it just feels gratuitous and takes me out of the main story. So how do you write books in different voices because I've I sometimes enjoy books like that and other times I don't because I mean in a couple of cases which I won't say out loud because I don't trash books on this show um like the book within the book is better than the book and I'm like why are you bringing me back to reality when I want to keep reading this thing and <laughs> well, so I'm not implying the, yours is going to do that <laughs> still keep it short yes. I, mean, I think the important thing is to know yeah what you're showing Mm-hmm. I mean, the problem can be right if the weighting isn't right. Like if you're, if it feels like the stories are almost equal in, in the attention that they're pulling. And I mean, sometimes that can work. I mean, there are writers who do that, like a story from then and a story now, and then they manage to have enough tension between them that they, that you can have that. But I think like for most, if the book within a book is really just a way of showing exposition, Right or of providing information that the characters can't get. It's the most interesting way to provide information that characters can't get. Then you want to get in and out, like as, make it as much to the point as possible. So the reader's not like, well, I wonder what happened during this break, right? Like, I think you can air a little bit more on, on wrapping things up in the, in the, the one story, even as you leave some things hanging, just so that the reader wants to see the conclusion of is what's going on in the pres- in the main story whenever that's set. Does that make sense? Did I just No, no, it does. I-, I just um so did you include the entire book within the book or did you do pieces of it? Pieces of okay. it. Okay. I mean, I guess it kind of is, but no, it's like there's an implication that there's probably a, a little more of it, but it's just like a very specific window of time that we're getting. Right. So one thing I've been thinking about 
my from in my own writing is uh points of view and how to choose them because uh this came mo- th- this became most obvious when I was writing the solo book and that I just for some reason on one scene I got stuck knowing that people have already seen the scene and I'd also read about it via the middle grade book's point of view and I didn't know how I was going to do it again and mm-hmm. so I realized changing the point of view of somebody else who's in the scene, but seeing mm-hmm. it from not the main character's point of view would make it interesting. And since since I kind of had that breakthrough, I've been wondering when, whose point of view to choose when and when not to show somebody. Like when you're, you're hiding something or obfuscating something, there's your mm-hmm. word for the day. Mm-hmm. Do you ever come across stuff yeah, like no, that? I love, I love point of view. Um, I wrote my thesis in grad school. I mean, um, it's a very cool thing to say on uh, omniscient POV in YA. Um, and so I did a lot of things. I love omniscient when it's done well. I love like a fluid POV. Uh, every time I think I'm going to actually use it myself, I really don't. Um and I have had many points of view changed from books, but by editors, um, although not recently. Really? Um, that sounds like hell. I, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. The first draft of the Lois Lane book I wrote in third, and my editor's like, this should be first. And I'm like, okay. Um, I was a newbie. It's not like I could have pushed back. And I do feel like it was the right call. Um and, you know, like I'm always, I love third person. Um, so I did want to write a book in third person. And the frame up is in third person. And then there's like this one section in someone else's POV. And at first I thought, well, I want to show a bunch of people and move around because that's how most high stories work. But most high stories are movies. And um, it also felt as if it could feel like cheating a bit. And it really is Danny's story. So I think I decided fairly early on after some experimentation of things that just didn't feel right, that I wanted to be pretty close in Danny's head in her POV. Mm-hmm. Um, and that enables different kinds of surprises. Right. Um, and it also means that you are closer to her as the mastermind running the heist than you are in a lot of heist stories in terms of, you know, what you need to know emotionally and all that stuff. Um, but doesn't the so, um, yeah. the mastermind in the heist group, don't you not want to look too deeply into their head or else you'll get all the, 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 the deeper plans that we don't find out until the near the very end? Well, uh, well, there's different. Okay, this is where am I'm I asking you on my heist I- nerd hat. Heist nerd hat. <laughs> Um, there's different kinds of heists, right? There's the heist where you know the plan and then the plan goes off the rails. Mm-hmm. There's a heist where um, some parts of the plan are concealed no matter who the main characters are and how much you know. Most heists sort of play with a little bit with both, right? Um, and so, yes, it is tricky. Like, you have to... It's tricky to do it in a way that you're not cheating anything. So, yes, there are surprises and they're set up. But is it what the main character would be thinking about or you just don't show them during that time when Mm -hmm. they would be thinking about it? And also there's a bunch of other people involved in the heist who have their own agendas and uh, and there's people who are also trying to steal the thing who have their own agenda. So, you know, you have all of um, you have enough balls in the air to sort of keep them moving so that the. A traditional mastermind, yes, but Danny is like someone planning this with a week who's sort of doing it all on the fly. Mm. Um, so I think there's a way in which she's still, she. it's not like your the money heist, like, you know, where this guy has been planning this forever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it, it's as much about the emotions of the relationships and who can rely on who as it is about anything else. But hopefully there are some good twists in there. Um, but yeah, I think Danny not necessarily being able to trust everyone around her, um, even though she's, she's in charge of the heist is, yeah. is, the, you know, is kind of how I chose to tackle that. But like every, every heist has its own 
you know, you just got to make your rules and then stick within them or it feels like a cheat, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're tricky. Um, I think it's easier to do in third person. And I think first it would have been, it would have felt like cheating if you didn't know everything that she knows. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of distance there in the third person that you get. Yeah, I think, I think that's one thing I don't, I guess I struggle with with first person. Because, I mean, I can't, I never know when to hide something that the main character is thinking. I mean, Agatha Christie did it in the murder of Roger yeah. Ackroyd. Right. And, uh, but, you know, I'm not Agatha Christie. <laughs> um, Shocker, I, I know. The first person slows things down, too, um, in a way, because you can only find out. You can only move as fast as your main character can move. So, like, if you're going to have a heavy plot book, I think sometimes it can be it can be difficult, more difficult to do in first person. Like, mm -hmm. I think a heist with all of its twists would be exhausting in first person. Yeah. Probably, like, 20K longer. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything craft or book related that you wanted to uh, discuss before I open up the uh, podcast to questions? I don't know. I'm very curious to see how people react to this book, especially because my last couple of books have been romances and this book has a romance, uh, but it's more of a mystery. Um, it's more of a mystery heist with fantasy elements. And so um, I'm a little nervous that people will be like, I wish this was a romance because some people have been that way already. And it's like, what well, it has a romance, but it really is, you know, it was never intended to be a romance. And that's where I get myself into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> You're writing whatever I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Been there. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to end the podcast right here. The live stream will continue with uh, the chat and Gwenda as, uh, having questions and answers. But if you would like to hear the rest of what we're talking about, you can support at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com and get the full episode. But for now, you can find me at merverse.com and I'm Tuesday, Thursday, Twitch at three o'clock Eastern time and find the podcast wherever fine podcasts are found. Gwenda, you want to tell us where to find you online? You can find me as at Gwenda Bond or Gwenda pretty much everywhere. Uh, Blue Sky, occasionally Twitter, not very much. Instagram, Gwenda Bond and Threads, I just got on. Um, but Blue Sky mostly lately. And then I have a sub stack um, because I just have not moved and can't figure it out. Uh, GwendaBond.substack.com where I try and write pretty regularly and put up lots of dog pictures and things. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for being on the show, Gwenda. And thank you guys for listening. And we'll see you next time, because you should be writing. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest-running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by The Fabulous, who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join The Fabulous at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com. Theme music provided by John Anilio. Art provided by Numbers Ninja, and podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License. You can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com.